Welcome, welcome to First Lutheran um, and this um, series of the Linton Luncheons. Um, Swedish meatballs, thumbs up. Yes, delicious. Thank you, ladies, for a wonderful, wonderful repast. Um, uh, today we have uh, our good friend Lynn Smith as our speaker, um, and I don't know what Lynn has not done. She certainly has a relationship, I mean, with the city, <laughs> relationship here at First Lutheran for a long time, and uh, she's going to tell us what's going on with Keith Park or the various things. We have an Easter egg hunt coming up. I think there are flyers on your tables, uh, all sorts of things. Um, I'm just going to let her chat it up. Uh, because this is a great place for that kind of forum and discussion. Um, before we go on, um, let's say grace. Gracious God, thank you for today and for the coming of spring in our lives to see green things coming up through the ground um, and renew hope in you and restoration. Uh, bless the meal that we're about to partake to the nourishment of our bodies that we have partaken, plus the hands and the hearts that have made it for us. And always help us to remember those who have nothing to eat and know where to lay their heads. All this we ask in your name that is holy. Amen. Amen. Um, after Lynn's discussion, there's obviously question and answer time. And I have a special announcement about next week. And um, without further ado, Lynn Smith. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank Pastor Jeff for this invitation. And I'd also like to thank all of the volunteers who have made today's lunch and have made the whole series such a wonderful event. And finally, I want to thank everyone here, the community that is First Evangelical Lutheran Church. Some of you may recognize me from the Campello Business Association meetings or from the Keith Park Neighborhood Association or the Frederick Douglass Neighborhood Association or outdoor movie nights or little free libraries or the fountain in Keith Park which is now flowing for the first time in 37 years. I guess you could call me an activist, an organizer, some people like to call me that one mosquito in the room in the middle of the night that keeps you awake all night. Annoying, but persistent. You know, persistence, every time I think of persistence in history, I think of this church, organized in 1867, the sanctuary erected in 1922, the replacement chance organ dedicated in 1968. And contrary to popular opinion, I was alive for only one of the above. <laughs> However, born in 1952, there are certain chapters of my life history that taught me lessons that shape the decisions I make today and the causes that I'm involved in today. And I'm sure it's the same for many of you in this room. So here goes my topic for today, a sharing of life lessons learned. Life lesson number one, when a woman buys a house and has no husband in tow, the neighborhood does not go to ruin. I moved to Brockton in 1985 and I bought my little bungalow, which was built in 1932 from a kit from Sears Roebuck. I bought that house for $82,000, a fortune, <clears throat> and much to the horror of my neighbors, Kenny Porter, a fireman, Al Bishop, a mechanic at Woodward Spring, Ray Lassard, an electrician, and Wally Eckberg, a man of many talents <laughs> who also had dead stuffed animals in his basement. <laughs> I was a single woman, a single woman with no husband, the neighborhood had gone to ruin. Eddie DeGoli, who built the house, was rolling in his grave. Needless to say, I survived, the men put up with me, and the icing on the cake is today, 35 years later, my mortgage is paid in full. Yeah. Lesson number two, living as a single woman does not mean a life less lived. Now, it was not my first choice to be a single woman. 
I grew up the oldest of six children in Boston. My mom was a union teacher, my dad a union plumber. Union is the operative word here. One of my earliest memories is the ritual of pasting my dad's stamps into his membership book, proof that he had paid his monthly union dues. I went to girls' Latin school. I went there for six years from grade 7 to grade 12. This was a public school, but it was an entrance exam school. 300 applicants for every one seat at that school. We were much smarter than our male counterparts at Boston Latin School, whose alums were folks like Ralph Waldo Emerson and Benjamin Franklin. Underachievers compared to the women of Codman Square, Dorchester, as far as we were concerned. And you know, when you're one of six kids, each of whom is expected to go to college, the deciding factor back in the 1970s was money. So after six years of an all-girl high school, I ended up going to an all-girl college, Emmanuel, conveniently located in the Fenway Longwood area of Boston. And to the delight of my parents, I was able to commute by bus every day from my house in West Roxbury to pay for room and board when you're the oldest of six kids going to college was out of the question. So we women commuter students of Emanuel would pool our resources and we would rent a school bus and we would take the bus to the dances at Boston College and Holy Cross. Surely a suitable match would be found in those medieval days before eHarmony. But alas for me, it was not meant to be. Crying to my mother one day that I was destined to wither and die on the vine, she said, oh, for Pete's sakes, go take a night course and see if you can find a man that might take a liking to you. So I went to Quincy Junior College and there was one line at the registration event that was all men. Ha ha, this is the class for me, I thought with glee. Three months later, I was standing behind home plate at my first Little League game, mask on my face, chest protector on my body, shin guards on my legs, ball and strike counter in my hand, the first woman umpire of the South Shore Baseball League. In 1976, I might add, I was voted umpire of the year. And when the umpires went on strike, the major league umpires went on strike in the 80s, I was actually on the list as a replacement umpire. But my father, the union plumber, said, you shall not cross a picket line. So out of that experience, no husband but a lovely trophy. <laughs> Life lesson number three, fear not, take a chance. What's the worst that can happen? So this umpire experience gave me the courage to take a job at a bank. This was way out of my comfort zone because in third grade I got needs improvement in math. But it wasn't really a math job, it was a sales job. And in a very unusual occurrence for the 1970s, I went from office manager to assistant vice president to senior vice president to executive vice president. 13 years, to senior management position at a bank that grew from 200 million in assets to 3 billion in assets. Now women in those days were in operations or they were in human resources. To be a business development officer, a calling officer was not normal. I remember one day as a young girl, I took three customers to a business life lunch at the very she-she Parker House Hotel, you know, where they invented the Parker House roles. Their organizations represented about $300 million in deposits at my bank. I was a wreck. The bill for the lunch came, and I looked at it, you know, very casually, but long enough so that the guys would think I knew what I was doing. And the waiter took the bill, and a few minutes later he came back. 
And he said, Madame, I cannot accept this card. And I said, well, why not? And he said, because it's your stop and shop check cashing card. <laughs> but that experience in banking eventually led me to New Haven, Connecticut, where I took on a job as part of a team to build a brand new bank in 2008. In the middle of the worst recession since the Great Depression, we built a de novo, a new bank in New Haven. And not only did we build it from scratch, but we built it for people who never had opened a checking account, people who went to check cashing stores, people who were the victims of payday lenders, people who for the first time in their life had a savings account. When I die my obituary, that's going to be the first line of my obituary. I'm very proud of the work that I did at Start, Communi Start Community Bank. And while I was there, I taught over 3,000 high school students on the verge of their first job, financial capability. We didn't call it loot camp with an L. We called it, boot, we called it loot camp with an L, not boot camp with a B. And for the first time, they learned about credit scores, and they learned about overdraft fees, and they learned how to write a check, and they could open an account without a parent co-signer and be responsible for that account. Life lesson number four, let the others laugh. Just do what you love, enjoy life, and save your money for the important stuff. So in 1990, I had my midlife crisis. I quit my job as executive vice president of the bank, and I took a job with Colette Tours. I was the lady with the umbrella. We're walking, we're walking, we're walking and talking, we're walking and talking. I love to travel. The only thing was you had to take 40 people with you. I got to travel all over the world. And there was one room, rule, don't leave anyone behind. So all of that worked out pretty well until I got to Port Huron, Michigan one day. We were on our way from Mackinac Island to Niagara Falls. We stopped at McDonald's for a coffee break. Three hours later, I realized I left Vera and Elena at the McDonald's. So a series of frantic phone calls to Canada Coach, which is the equivalent of Greyhound up in Canada. We got them on the bus so that they could catch up to us at the hotel in Niagara Falls. So at midnight that night, my job was to go down to the bus terminal and pick Vera and Elena up. And you can tell I was really looking forward to that encounter. But when I got to the lobby of the hotel to call a cab, my bus driver was standing there. And he said, we're a team. I'm taking you down. We're going to pick Vera and Eleanor up together. And I said, no, 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 you don't have to do that. And he said, no, we work together. We stay together. We're picking them up together. And off we went in the 50-passenger bus to pick up Vera and Eleanor. You know, if they had yelled at me, it would have been bad enough, but they didn't. They just whimpered. <laughs> so I got them back to the hotel, but you know, for a long time I thought about that bus driver. And he was a, a stand-up guy. And you know, eventually the sharp edge of leaving Vera and Elena kind of wore off. But I kept remembering that bus driver and how he stood up and, and supported me. So I thanked him the best way I knew how. I married him. <laughs> So on some of the buses, I would hand out the hotel keys and I would say to my passenger, now I'm in room 342. If you have any problem, give me a call. And if a man answers the phone, don't worry, I'm sleeping with the driver. <laughs> so that gets me to life lesson number five. Don't be looking for love in all the wrong places unless it's in a Canada coach bus terminal. <laughs> and this gets me to Dr. Fruth. Because in March of 1993, Ken and I, the bus driver and I, were married in this very church by Dr. Fruth. And right next to that chance organ, right next to my Carl Avenue um, contingent, was my neighbor Laverne Eckberg. Some of you know Laverne. And Kenny had driven for many years the a cappella choir of Eastern Nazarene College to all of their concerts. And so as a wedding gift, the choir came and sang at the church. They came an hour early before the wedding and they gave a concert here at the church. 
And then they sang three or four songs during the wedding ceremony as well. So this church was filled the day of my wedding. Some of you might have even come to the wedding. Not for me, but for the free concert. So that gets me to my life lesson number six. Be open to the miracles of life because you never know what God has in store for you. You know, Ken passed away a few years ago, but I often feel his spirit in this church. And I think of those life lessons and I think about the circle of life and I think about today how I am defined by many folks as a community activist or organizer. And one thing I know for sure is the spirit of community is alive and well here at First Evangelical. And that's why I ask all of you, are you in or are you out? Are you an ally or are you an accomplice? Are you engaged or are you complacent? So in 2014, right here, in this room, right where I am standing, a small band of neighbors came to a ward meeting and talked about the newly formed Keith Park Neighborhood Association. We wanted to make a difference in the community. We asked folks in the audience that night to join us. And so was born the annual Easter egg hunt. And you have a flyer on your tables. I think this is our sixth or seventh or eighth. We've been doing it for a long time. Hosted right in the gym named after Dr. Fruth. And now we do things like the Flag Day picnic in George Keith Park, which will be um, June 9th and Friday Night Flicks, where we show the big uh, screen movie in the um, park. And we have the annual Holiday History Lantern Walk. This past December, the first Wednesday of December, we had 160 people meet at the Gilmore School, walk to George Keith Park, they make their own lanterns, walk up Main Street, decorate all the little Christmas trees on Main Street, go across the street to the firefighters to say thank you for the service, and then they come right here to the church for a concert and cookies and chocolate milk and vanilla milk. I mean, life is good. <laughs> and as I said, the Georgie Keith Park, because we were gadflies, we got money to restore it, we got money to make the fountain working, and we need to be very proud of that park because you know it's an Olmsted design park. You know Frederick Law Olmsted and Emerald Necklace and Central Park? His sons designed the Georgie e. Keith um, Park. So there's a saying that everybody knows, be the change you want to see in the world. That's too much for me. It's too overwhelming. I prefer this quote from Parker Palmer. Our real freedom comes from being aware that we do not have to save the world. We merely need to make a difference in the place where we live. And in order to make a difference, we need to have leaders and followers, cooks and bottle washers, quarterbacks and blockers. It's okay to be an ally, but it's better to be an accomplice. And we all need to be persuaders. Anyone who's a parent knows that you have to be a persuader. Anybody who volunteers in a project knows you have to be a persuader. Could be a PTO, could be Thanksgiving dinner. How are you going to assign tasks? Will Uncle Frank really be able to make that lemon meringue pie that he's promised everybody? Will Ethel really be able to stick to the Origami for Everyone project budget? How can you be a leader that is heard, that values the people around you, that inspires people to be and to do their best? How can we all get stuff done? One way for me is to remember all those life lessons that I talked about. The other is to find a method to find out who has the best qualities and the best abilities for each part of the puzzle. So I use the medicine wheel. It's an ancient American story. It's a valuable tool. Mother Earth is a circle. The sun and moons are circles. The path that each takes is a circle. Our lives are a circle from birth to death to rebirth. So the symbol, the symbol of the medicine wheel also contains descriptions of the seasons and of animals and of the traits of those animals. So see if you hear yourself in the medicine wheel. The north 
is represented by the buffalo, the winter, the color white. The buffalo likes to take control of a task and work quickly towards a goal. They bring together all of the members of the circle to achieve their goal. But be careful, they can be harsh and they can be autocratic. So how many buffaloes do we have in the room? The south is represented by the deer. The summer, the color green. Deer people are collaborative, they're supportive, they're trusting, they're careful of feelings, but be careful, they overcommit and they have trouble saying no. How many of you are deer? The east is represented by the eagle, the spring, the color yellow. Eagles are people of creativity, innovation, they're visionaries, they fly above the fray, but don't give them a spreadsheet. And don't give them a column of numbers to add up because they're never going to get to the right number. The West is the bear, the autumn, the color brown, Analyth analytical, methodical, introspective, great at spreadsheets, great at numbers, but oh man, can they be stubborn. So who's a bear in the room? So. Are your talents going to match the piece of the puzzle for a project? When we organize community events or community projects, people in our associations can say, hey, I'm a bear, don't give me that to do. Hey, I'm a deer, I'll be part of the team. Hey, I'm the eagle, I'll design the flyer. So it gives permission to people to say what they're good at and what they want to do and what they don't want to do without fighting. You know, I'm volunteering right now to teach regular people, residents, to be leaders. It's called the Team Brockton Resident Leader Program. We're effecting positive change one street at a time, one block at a time, and we use the medicine wheel so that people, when they come as strangers to the meeting, feel comfortable about sharing what their talents is, are. You know the story of stone soup. Everybody puts a little tiny bit in, and then you have a beautiful meal like this one to feel, feed the whole community. So anyway, those men, on Carl Ave that made fun of me, a single woman buying a house all by herself in 1985. Sadly, they're all dead now. They're gone. But you know what? My neighbors now are straight, they're gay, they're single, they're married, they're old, they're young, they're white, they're brown, they're black, and we know each other, and we share tools with each other, and we help with each other, and we're community. Which brings me back to my final life lesson. The last life skill I learned was from my father, the plumber. He'd grab whatever kid was making trouble and throw that kid in the truck and say, come on, you're gonna be my apprentice for the day. Didn't matter, girl or no girl, get in the truck. Come on, I need a helper. So don't be afraid what the other kids say about you. It's okay to be a plumber. Speak up for yourself, be honest and true, do your best, don't be a quitter. That's what my dad taught us. And any issue in the world, there was one way to solve it. My dad would say, it's the squeaky wheel that gets the grease. And then he would always add, and that's because there's a nut loose. <laughs> Thanks for having me today. on the 13th. What else is coming up? Great things happening at the library. Yes. We're having a mass memories event so you can bring a memory of your past. They'll scan it, you tell the story, and it's going into a huge digital notebook to tell the history of Brockton. So a lot of good things um, are happening and I hope that you'll all be accomplices and not just allies. What a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Uh, do you preach on Sunday? <laughs> <laughs> I can't.
sure my congregation gets tired of me at times. Uh, a couple of things. One, I must shoot my own horn. I got to dedicate Keith Park from the religious standpoint. I got to uh, lead an invoca invocation. I was only there like 22 minutes because I had to come back here. It was a Saturday. But um, it was a, what a great event. And um, thank you for reminding me of that. Um, so thank you, Lynn. I'm very deeply touched by that. Um, a couple of announcements from our end of things. Um, if you have nowhere to go during Holy Week, which is in about 10 days, starting about 10 days, we have services on Palm Sunday, on uh, uh, Monday, Thursday. We always do, we always, we are doing a Passover Seder event, as well as uh, a Monday, Thursday service here and upstairs in the church. Good Friday is at 7 p.m., a service of Tenebrae, and <coughs> Easter Sunday is at 7.45 and 9 a.m., preceded the day before by a wonderful egg hunt um, and other things that happen at the church. Um, the food pantry is in operation on Saturday the 20th also. Um, we also are very proud to announce on Sunday, April 28th, and this is really a community event, we have been, we have been asked to co-host the visitation of the presiding bishop, presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church Michael Curry to be here at the nine o'clock service. And if you don't know who Michael Curry is, if any of you turn, tuned into last year's royal wedding at Windsor Castle, at Windsor Chapel, he was the black American bishop who provided the sermon. And he is uh, Grace Chapel, which is an Episcopal mission of the Diocese of Massachusetts, and, and we are partnering, partnering with it. Grace Chapel is a part of the four churches that are part of First Lutheran's umbrella. But he will be here preaching that day. And he is an extraordinary preacher, if you remember that from, La from the Royal Wedding, and an extraordinary presence. So please come. We would love to have you. Uh, I'll be here in many familiar faces, and four, three or four bishops. Ooh, rarely do you get to see that. So um, lots of prelates. And uh, regarding next week is our last Lenten luncheon, and I'm sad to say Steve Domish had to relinquish because he got a job. So we're glad he got a job, and he kind of told me that up front. He goes, ah. and I ran to Lynn. I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? And she gave me, of course, 25 names, <laughs> and it overwhelmed me. And I thought about what we should do, and I hope that this is an appropriate gift. I'm going to be next week's speaker, and what we're going to do, and this is what I used to do in my previous life, I'm going to do a presentation with that piano of the American Musical Theater. And I'm a concert pianist, and um, also I did that for many years. So uh, we'll look at Gershwin, we'll look at the American Musical Theater. You will probably have to sing along, because I do that. And, and you will also have a delicious meal of clam chowder. So that's the last luncheon. I hope that's okay with everybody. Do you like that idea? And um, so we'll have fun with that. Um, I ran it by some of the powers that be here at First Lutheran. And like, yes! And so I said, okay, I guess I have no... They started singing songs at me too. So. Anyway, uh, thank you for being here.